Okay. So with our esteemed panel up here who have, have uh, really uh, shared a lot of knowledge this morning, um, we've covered quite a breadth of material. Um, a little insight from myself, I'm, I'm a brand owner. Um, you know, ev everything that was discussed, you know, is, is, is part of our job to make sure that, that we figured this all out. Um, with a lot of these parameters considered, um, these different perspectives, these different approaches, it's, it, it's all pieces of the same puzzle for me at the end of the day. So I found it very interesting, um, really, all, all the talks contributed a, a very different perspective that all really get to the same thing. And as I was, I was sitting here reflecting on it this morning, I, I thought, you know, I was, I was pretty comfortable with packaging when I came in today. Um, I'm not so sure now. Um, there's, there's, always, there's always more and more and more, more things to think about. So before um, I ask any questions or we, we come up with some of the other questions, what I would like to do first is, is open up the floor for any questions that you had relative to any of the, any of the specific talks um, that you didn't get a chance to ask or maybe that's something you thought of on break or while having a discussion with somebody else. So does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists really specific to any of their, their talks before we maybe open it up to the, the broader audience or panel? Now look at your notes. There we go. So Paul, this is a question for you. Um, I, did, uh, I did learn something, even though I've heard that presentation many times, uh, it's always interesting you pick up new uh, tidbits, but um, with your definition of color additives, and then you said that those color additives can be used in food packaging pretty much at will if it's approved as a, as a direct food, as a directly added to food as a color additive. Does that, um, could that be said as well for all, all food additives can be used? So it's just a specific for color additives can be used in food packaging directly. Um, yeah, thank you for that question, John. No, that, that is specific to color additives. A direct food additive um, cannot be used as a indirect food additive without uh, an approval for use as an indirect food additive. But there is a distinction for that as well for generally recognized as safe substances. Uh, for the majority <coughs> of substances that are generally recognized as safe for use as direct food additives are also considered uh, generally recognized as safe as indirect additives as well. So if it has a uh, listing in 184, for example, by 184 I mean Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations Part 184, it can be used as an indirect food additive as well. I, I might add, there, there, relative to the color additives, you know, I talked about using some sophisticated instruments. Uh, when it comes to color additive, we don't need any of that. We just use our eyes. If that color additive turns that food color, it's not allowed. And recently, that just happened we, in the lab. Someone was doing a test. And they were mixing uh, a, a sample that, that was a food oil and, and a colored plastic. And they were looking for something else. And I said, well, why do you keep mixing this thing? And they said, well, I haven't finished the time yet. I said, as soon as it changes color, it's done. It's not allowed. So you don't need an instrument for that. You just you own a pair of eyes. Thank you all for your talks this morning. I really enjoyed all of them. Uh, Jim left us with his last slide he had, can safety be conveyed in a manner that transcends geopolitical boundaries? And I like that because of the, uh, as he mentioned, incongruence uh, that leads to compliance gaps. Uh, we've, in terms of toxicology, you know, the UN came out with GHS, uh, Globally Harmonized System. And many, most countries now have begun to approach it and incorporate it in some sort of way. Do you think in 
the terms of safety though from the different approaches that Jim mentioned uh, dealing with migration or dealing with exposure dealing with toxicology do you think that there is an approach that we could harmonize such as even if we with the vehicle let's say for example ISO types of tests we recommend are follow often OECD guidelines, so it's similar to ISO, and um, so that is harmonized across the world. And we also participate in a lot of international meetings with JECFA, um, WHO assessments, we collaborate with EFSA, other groups. So when you see some of the more popular chemicals or more um, public ones, that's where you have the more overt um, harmonization where we're obviously working together. But behind the scenes, we also work together too with collaborations and discussions. So we are uh, working on that. And we try, one of the importance with the new science is to get the new science validated at an international level as well. So it is standard across the world. I definitely think it's something we need to start moving towards and yeah, having those discussions around where are the commonalities and are we essentially doing the same thing and are we arriving at the same conclusions? Things like ISO is, is, is definitely a good way However, how that's interpreted in regulation can differ. So ISO standards can appear in regulation and how you and how they appear can cause divergences. Equally, the political landscape can have a massive influence. So even if the regulatory system is in one way and is, is harmonized, the political landscape can overturn that. So Europe is a fantastic example of where you have some, you can have some very good regulation. However, the decision making is, is, is very, can be very much removed. So you've got like the European Food Safety Authority do risk assessment, you have the European Commission who do risk management and make the ultimate decision. And there can be, ma BPA is a perfect example again of how this didn't necessarily result in a decision that I feel was a science-based one. So I think that's actually the challenge you're going to face even afterwards. So you, having, being mindful of that eventuality and that just reality of it is really important as well. Thank you all. Appreciate it. If I can comment on that a little bit. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, certainly toxicologists done a great job, you know, follow OECD guidelines and, you know, and the data, I think, largely can be shared whether you submit to FDA or submit to EFSA or any regulatory agency. But I think what's difficult is once we translate into a regulation, that becomes language that can no longer be translated back and forth. So, you know, as an engineer by training, I think the way to overcome 
uh, reference frame differences is try to find a way to non-dimensionalize it. Just take it in a way that, you know, irrespective of any kind of system that you use. What do I mean by that? If we, instead of, uh, if we go from toxicology and then start talking about safety factors, you know, we can say safety factors of 5,000. I think that's a universal language, whether it's in US or EU, right? Uh, instead of saying this is compliant, I think if both places will not only talk about the regulation, but also to give as much uh, publicity, if you will, to the, the, the safety factors that are already in there, then that becomes a translatable language. Uh, uh, <laughs> that become translatable from one to the other. I know we do that, but you know, but people just don't seem to appreciate the power of that kind of simple metrics. Uh, but I mean, the general public. Uh, I think I'll just stop there. <laughs> And I know my life would be exponentially easier if the world could agree on, on one system. What I get faced with a lot is, well, if it's safe here, why is it not safe there? And my answer is typically, I'm not saying that it's not safe there. What I then have to say is it's not regulatorily compliant there, which doesn't necessarily, you know, to, to go to Jim's example of the, the SPET, for a while, I mean, ultimately it's it's safe, right? The the FDA said it's safe, so it's safe. But you still couldn't use it in Europe because they hadn't come to their own same conclusion with a different set of data for a different set of rules. So it would be much easier. And a question about the exposure yardstick that's being used to measure the. Uh, migration or transfer of components from different types of packaging into food around the globe. And I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing is, to piggyback on that is, I think we need to think about the future and want to get your thoughts of it for a harmonized system to evaluate food packaging uh, in terms of the amount of materials that can transfer to the packaged food. and also to have more predictive uh, tests that <coughs> represent reality. I think one thing I saw is Dr. Grob's work up on the screen, and he's actually published some articles that say certain types of food simulants and those sorts of tests grossly overestimate the amount that goes into food, which is great if you believe in the precautionary principle, but if you believe in the realistic principle and what Congress said is, hey, we need to have a reasonable approach. How do we get more reasonable testing methods that really predict how much go into food and you know what could be done to encourage that both in the states and around the globe? I'm the only chemist in here. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, and I think there is opportunities to, to work on some of that harmonization from the, the migration and exposure assessment um, side of things. And I know we've actually had some uh, discussions with our Health Canada partners as well as uh, at least Luigi Rossi was involved with the, the EU that we had some discussions with him as well. And you can imagine, you know, the fits and starts you have with uh, talking between countries. Um, so, but I think there is some room for that, and actually I was really interested in uh, your presentation about uh, the tools that you've developed, and I think there's some collaborative work that we could actually do to uh, give some of our data and actually start looking at how we might be able to use that particular tool in our evaluation. So, I think there's plenty of room. I mean, it's interesting as well because Exposure, it, as, as being, if you think of it as being part of risk assessment, it's the dynamic and changing part of it. Okay, the hazard is, is an intrinsic property. The substance exposure is a real-world phenomenon. And that, by its very nature, varies from geography to geography. People consume different foods. They use different packaging. So you kind of need to allow for that equally well in your risk assessment. So I think 
And so I'm glad you raised the precautionary principle because that, that, that's going a level deeper in thinking about the, the value system that underpins a regulatory framework, which if, if that's not harmonized, then regulation is always going to diverge as well. So having those, asking those very fundamental questions when you're trying to look at harmonization, I think is really important. And uh, also specifically to the United States, Yes, we do have um, guidance documents which list generally applicable types of either migration solvents or um, exposure constants to be used to calculate exposure, but those are generally applicable. If you have information on the specific use that you have for your product and you want to limit that product to that specific use, um, you can come into FDA pre-notification consultation, explain the reasoning, the scientific reasoning behind either you want to do a different simulant or you want to use different uh, constants in your exposure calculation. And as long as it's scientifically supported, um, we can evaluate it and provide you an opinion back of yes, you can either use that for example, your future FCN or no, we don't agree. Just because it's in the guidance document doesn't mean that's what you have to do. That is just an option. If you have scientifically supported information for an alternative approach, we're more than happy uh, to review that information. And then if it is supported, you know, it can be used to support uh, a notification, for example. So uh, if you have those type of questions, please come in for a pre-notification consultation. Thanks. So this is kind of a, a general question. So when we talk about substance exposure uh, from the FDA and maybe from the European perspective, do we consider like combinations of additives? I mean, a class of substance, for example, of phthalates. So we know there's several phthalates, right? Together, taken together, maybe you get one effect as opposed to an individual, you get an additive effect. You know, so considering something like that, and then we're also seeing phthalates contaminate actually our food supply. So now that's another exposure route. It's actually in the food. It's not just coming from the packaging. Not to say we're using phthalates, but that's just an example, you know, in general. Um. Now that's a multifaceted question. Um. <laughs> it's the reality we're looking at. It, it, is, it is the reality. I mean, from a, you've woven in a toxicology question in with an exposure side of things. So as an exposure chemist, you know, I can look at, and we typically look at compounds, you know, individually, A, B, and C, you calculate an exposure, and then the toxicologist can work their, uh, their magic on uh, those numbers. Um, so for, from a standpoint of an exposure side, you know, I could do a cumulative exposure to various materials provided that uh, our toxicologists need that type of an assessment. So we can do those types of things from, you know, a mathematical standpoint, but it really drives down to what's going on on the tox side. Do you want to lump compound A and compound B together? Is there some uh, physiological, biological reason to do that? <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned biological because, I mean, my question to the, probably the FDA in general is, you know, this whole area of bioactive substances, that's kind of keeping us awake at night, at least from the consumer products goods company side of things. You know, it's, I mean, how do we, how are we looking at, this, this is like a new world, right? You know, it's the whole BPA, BPA question. It's not toxic, it's not a toxic, toxic substance, but it's biologically active has endocrinic, potential endocrinic effects, so where are we? <laughs> Help. <laughs> okay, from uh, that side, we're talking, we can separate in that into mechanism versus uh, toxicity. And anything that you eat is going to affect some type of mechanism. If you eat tofu, it's going to affect uh, your estrogenic system, right, uh, or endocrine system. So it's really getting to uh, often our recommendations and the type of studies are very broad, capture mainly toxicology because you're not, even if you do have a mechanism activated, you have other mechanisms within your system that can counter that, can balance that, uh, the whole idea of homeostasis. It's not until you push those, those mechanisms beyond a certain level that you start to build up toxicity and that toxicity builds up and builds up. And um, that's what we try to capture in the broad tox testing studies. 
However, we are looking at mechanisms now. Um, there's a lot more studies becoming available. A lot of the in vitro studies, cellular studies, all look at mechanism. And those provide supporting information to give, like I was talking about before, a more, as I say, our assessments are accurate, but more precision within that assessment, a better understanding. And maybe moving forward, like I was saying before about uh, in my talk about, taking all the in vivo data we have on the tox side and all this new data and starting to make those correlations to where we can see what, what point or what mechanism or multiple combinations of mechanisms could be predictive of eventual toxicity. Um, but that's something we still need to work on and still are working on. If I can just go back a little bit on the comments of, about exposure, I think uh, the, uh, it's a lot of undertaking for, you know, CREM and under the auspices of the European uh, Consortium and the Commission and for the FDA to do. But I think the industry itself can do a lot of the work, uh, printing ink and laminating adhesive, for example. You know, the industry probably have very much the same toolbox and pretty much know the exact quantity of chemical that are actually used and probably can come up with a very good exposure model and actually come to a very precise uh, uh, exposure assessment. And that in turn will give a lot of credence as we, uh, to, to the regulatory agencies, whether here or Europe or anywhere, how far away we are from the ADI, how, far, you know, how many order of magnitude we are actually to today, so that we, you know, we do not get uh, unpre <coughs> or call unprepared to respond to the questions <coughs> of uh, safety factors. So something come up, we, we can say, you know, we actually have the act realistic model that actually can answer those questions. Today, I think we just call it NIAS and then we start doing the worst thing we can do, which is basically do the hazard analysis and then just throw up our hands. I think it's not the agency's role alone, I think it's the industry that need to coalesce and do its job. So. Just two quick perspectives. On the question of multiple sources of exposure to a single, single chemical in, in Europe, EFSA are calling for all sources of exposure to be considered. So the same chemical can be present in food con contact materials. It may even exist as an additive or a flavoring equally it can be present in personal care products, cosmetics, other consumer products. And they want to see that factored into an exposure assessment. Equally, the Scientific Committee for Consumer Safety, who regulate cosmetics, want to see dietary sources of exposure to a chemical considered, especially for CMR substances. So that's something that I've been busy with a lot lately. Um, on the question of multiple exposures to multiple chemicals, the cumulative question, I think there's a very good framework in the US at the moment for pesticides. I think that's a good guiding light in terms of how they manage multiple potencies and multiple sources of exposure and relative potencies. In Europe, I think they've cocked this up completely for pesticides. There's a, there's a, EFSA have a common action group that can have up to like 200 chemicals in it. So when you're trying to do a risk assessment, you're, you're stuck straight away. So again, I think the, the, the bioactive question is precisely the thing you need to ask w when addressing that, even when you're doing your exposure assessment. Since uh, uh, many of you are, are from the FDA, so I just take uh, this opportunity to ask uh, the question about uh, label, labeling. As a requirement, uh, each uh, ingredient or additives directly added to the food must be listed in label, right? And uh, however, if we add the ingredients or additives into packaging material, and uh, the packaging material will, will release the uh, additives of, uh, or in ingredients to the foods. So the label must be listed this ingredients or additive. And if so, how much? Because, <clears throat> for example, if we add 1,000 uh, 1, ppm, something into the uh, packaging material, and the packaging will release, but may not only list 10% uh, 
or 50 percent or even not 100 percent. So the question is about label. We need to list the uh, additive into uh, packaging. If so, how much we need to be listed in the label? So the answer to that question isn't dependent upon the amount that goes into food. The question is, um, is that component being released from the packaging in order to have an intended technical effect on the food at the point of consumption? Uh, if it is, then it has to be included on the label. It doesn't matter what level it is. If it's not, then it's not a food additive. It's Well, I mean, it is a food additive, but it's not a food ingredient and would not be included on the label. So, However, if we say that as an ingredient, for example, salt, we not treat the salt as a food additive. We chose the ingredients. So how about we insert the salt into packaging material and let the salt release to the food? This is treated okay. additive. Yeah, if, you add food, if you add salt to food, you have to include it on the label. So it doesn't matter if you're just sprinkling, on, sprinkling it on the food and then packaging the food, or if you had it in the package and it transferred from the package to the food. It's intended to have an effect on the food. Therefore, it has to be labeled. Uh, how about amount? See, to my understanding, that uh, the label must have the uh, largest amount list first and go through to the uh, trees, right? But, but say, for example, we added the 1,000 ppm maybe the, directly into the uh, uh, juice, for example, uh, sodium benzos, and the list the, the third one or th or third one, the, 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 like the third one of the uh, ingredients. However, we add the 1,000 uh, ppm sodium benzoate in the packaging material. Packaging material released may be much lower than 1,000 uh, 1, uh, uh, ppm. So they should be moved to the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, ingredients list, something? Yeah, so there's sort of maybe two parts to your initial question, and maybe I didn't realize that. So there's no threshold of where you would not label something if it is added to the food in order to have an effect on the food. You would have to label it no matter what. But you are correct that um, uh, things added to the food are listed in um, concentration order. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that would be taken into account as to where that particular additive would be, would fall on the list of ingredients in the food. So. Okay, thank you. From a packaging perspective, you'd only label it if it has an intended technical right. effect so on the food. Saying, okay, and Dennis, you look like you have something to add. Right. Uh, I think if you have any specific questions, you should address these specific questions. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, I think that question was only relative if you're talking about an active ingredient. So you have an antioxidant in the, in the packaging film. And it's, it's, it's actually formulated. So they're using tocopherols, for example. So they have, it's formulated in the package in order for it to become an antioxidant. And so I would think, wouldn't they have to do some type of mig migration studies to understand over the, the shelf life and use of the package, how much migrates out? And then that would tell you where it would be labeled in the ingredients. I think that's the only example of what you spoke about that's applicable here. Is that is, it's an active ingredient made to diffuse through the, the packaging film become an, a, a food additive to protect it, to um, extend the life, uh, the life cycle, for example, shelf life. Okay, um, so I think that's exactly right. In that case, if you were actually doing that in order to have an effect on the food, you would have to do studies to, de and you would have to anyway, yeah. to determine how much is going into the food, and then that would base where it would fall in the ingredients list. But as Dennis said, uh, none of the FDA people up here are labeling experts. That's actually a completely different office than the one that we're in. Right. So, you know, if you have specific questions, contact that office. Well, if I can, I, I think the, 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 
what you're asking is already in place today. I think Greg mentioned, you know, BHT added to serial liners and BHT that use is indicated on the serial liner box. So uh, I think, you know, if you say how about things that are below that, well then question is how, you know, if, if you want to have every single component that's ever used on packaging to be listed, then, you know, you probably, the, 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 no container will ever hold enough information. And then you actually introduce more exposure from the printing inks to the food. So yeah, that, that, that's the reality, right? And, and that's, again, bear in mind that packaging itself, the, the exposure is orders of magnitude below that of edible food is probably on the orders of the flavor ingredients or even fractions of that. And we don't list every single possible flavor ingredients in the list of ingredients. We just say natural flavors. I think that's perfectly okay under the la labeling regulations. So, you know, it's simply not practical or for that matter useful to ensure consumer safety. Okay, so, since a lot of our our talks this morning really focused on chemistry and toxicology and some exciting new developments and analytical methodologies. I think the first question up on the slide is something that almost every panelist could, could address in a few sentences, kind of maybe we could just work our way down the line. And I, cause I think the interesting part is as our chemistry, which alluded to in one presentation, gets better and better and better, you know, how, what do we do with this information? You know, um, I, I found inter very interesting the slide about how you had that chromatogram that was just a mess, and then it interpreted what those things were. Well, if you let the public know that you found all those things, that, then, then, you know, again, how, how do we assess and utilize this information for really real safety assessments of our packaging materials? And I mean, we. We have toxicology perspectives, we have chemistry perspectives, we have analytical methodology. Just, if maybe we could just kind of go down the line and, and speak a few sentences of what you see, um, how we can use this. We're better in the lab, but just because it's there doesn't make it bad. Something along those lines. So um, if Greg, maybe you could start. Well, maybe Tim would start. Uh, okay. You don't mind me uh, uh, volunteering to put this on that? <laughs> well, it, it is true that our analytical capabilities have gone so far and we can now measure so little that I think it's, you know, um, relative to tox perspective, that's for sure. Um, we actually just, just yesterday uh, had a question from a different section of FDA that's actually interested in this. Um, and we, they asked, well, what examples do we have about where this happens? And one that I know most people in the room here probably are somewhat familiar about, that we had the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill. And that contaminated huge sections of our seafood harvesting area. Same thing happened with the Exxon Valdez. And then it is FDA's responsibility to make sure all that seafood is safe. And when you look at the concentrations and in, in, in order for us to open up the seafood fishing in those areas, we look at the main metric was for pHs. And we can measure pHs in incredibly small amounts. But the tox evaluation and their health hazard evaluation is thousands of times above what we can measure. That's actually true. And so now, you know, we're in this situation. I know Kirk and other people there have to deal with some of these low numbers, and, but we can actually uh, measure incredibly low numbers. Now, as far as the, the nanomaterials, there is some interest there. Um, how do we evaluate the safety of those? Uh, we've actually done a, a lot of testing on, on some of these materials, and do, are they released from packaging? And there's a size effect there that, that we know about. And um, basically, a lot of those materials are relatively l large compared to regular molecules that are released, and they tend to be released not at all. I mean, it's very difficult to measure nanomaterials that actually come from packaging material. Uh, 
they've put nano silver in packaging and initially what happens is you can measure a little bit of silver in the, in the food uh, but then it stops and that's basically because it's nothing more than a surface <coughs> effect and that material can't move its way through a packaging material because it's too big and so um, as far as other packaging materials um, how much is enough um, that, that's just a, a, we're going to have to deal with that uh, public image uh, of that we can measure very small amounts and the exposure is a lot less than, than we can actually measure in the lab, for sure. Please, please. Yeah. I think it's an important part about the public perspective, the public message, what's um, being interpreted in the public. And I can give a few examples here. Um, uh, I think it's fantastic that the land analytical chemistry is getting so good, the limited detection is getting so low. Uh, but the idea is that, oh, okay, we found all these things. Um, they must all be bad and terrible. And no, those limit le levels are much lower than would be expected to cause any toxicology. But the public yeah, perception, I'm sorry, the public perception is there. It's more of a perception of hazard. Um, and I give you an example. So with studies with, I didn't want to mention this word, though, but BPA and BPS, um, We've had some studies where we looked at both of those and they've been presented publicly as, okay, in this material we found, um, or in blood, we found BPA and we found BPS, so it must be terrible. However, there was a very big difference between limited detection uh, looking for those two separate chemicals. It's much, you can get much lower limit detection looking for BPS because there's a lot less um, contamination background from BPS than, as you would from BPA, so limited detection is higher. And so when I've seen some presentations of this, they're saying, oh, look, we found BPS2, it's just as bad as BPA. But when you look at the exposures, and they usually don't like to show this, is that the estimated exposure from BPA was here, while BPS was so low. So when you're talking about a bioactivity and potency and comparison action on mechanisms, you wouldn't expect them to have the same action because they aren't at the same levels, although it's coming across publicly that as long as it's there, it's a problem. And um, from the other side, I want to say about a good benefit of um, these increases in analytical methods. We had examples where things have been on the market for years. They've proved um, decades ago, and the methods were a little bit different then. And you get an exposure assessment, sometimes based on limited detection, because the uh, product or chemical might not really even be there, but there's a limited detection. That stops um, us being able to go completely to zero. Um, recently, we've had uh, um, some new submissions come in where the when to use this material, it's been used for a long time, but redid some of the analytical methods and used a much lower limit detection. And from what our previous exposure estimate was, we've been able to reduce that. So now we get in a more realistic level and it's not as exaggerated. We're talking about getting more realistic um, exposures, using better methods to get uh, more precise measurements. And that's what we're seeing in some of the resubmissions from products that were regulated and analyzed years and years ago. From the, from the standpoint of the supply chain that's a, um, part of making the packaging article, I find it, and an analytical chemist, I find it to be um, getting to the point where it's going to be very, very difficult to um, claim that something is free of. So phthalate free, BPA free. The lower and lower the detection limits go, we can go down to parts per trillion, you know, femtograms. Um, and w what we're going to do is now that it gets detected, then no one will be able to claim that something is free of uh, or, or that that chemical is not there. And it'll, it'll I think it'll, it'll drive a frenzy that'll, that'll, that should hopefully collapse itself uh, because it, it, it can't be sustained that you can continue to look at everything at a very, very low, low level when it really is insignificant in terms of the risk to the consumer, the risk to the public, even the risk to the environment. And I think that that's the challenge is to be able for the technical community and then the regulatory bodies also to be able to um, almost, uh, you, you, you want to intercept that public perception, that public rollout, so that that little, you know, that little quip that they state is already addressed because we see it first. We see the technical information first, but it's really a big challenge. I really see it as that. 
I agree. Um, one of the things with looking at that particular question, it always hit me back to the, the Paracelsus, you know, the dose makes the poison. Um, so it's not just a, you know, chemistry, we can go way down with our analytical processes, but from a tox side, where do you want to, where do you want to stop? And the, the concept of, you know, threshold of toxicological concern, can we, we're working on refining that process with work in our office, you know, can we refine it more? Are there particular things that, you know, it's maybe an aflatoxin-like material, you could have a threshold, okay, if they're aflatoxin-like materials, we really need to go down to this level. If it's something like diethyl ether, that's going to have a whole different type of a threshold. So being able to think about this and perhaps uh, like that TTC type concept will help us to say, okay, we can stop now. <laughs> that's a great idea, I think, to be able to group these categories um, from the toxicological uh, concern standpoint. That's excellent because that, help, that would help a lot with the industry itself along the supply chain. Yeah, just to say I totally agree. I, I was going to suggest the same thing, in fact. I swear. Um, <laughs> but, but, yeah, but taking a pragmatic view like that, and, 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 so, in, so I, I, and I totally agree that the consumer misperception is driven by hazard, and just because they think it's there, they think all hell is about to break loose, or that, there's a, that their food supply system has been compromised. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it is the exposure that contextualizes whether that detection is actually relevant uh, and has a, a human health risk or not. In terms of like, yeah, practical tools, using things like screening level type calculations and threshold toxicological concern can give you a way of just either, of, of quickly screening whether these measurements matter or not and whether you need to do anything further with them. So I, I think that's a, a, a quick win that we could get with, you know, a, a modest amount of work. I've, I've, I, I guess I've, you know, I was, I think we're all thinking alike. Well, I was thinking alike as well. Uh, TTC help contextualize the, the force of peaks and make it relevant. But I think, you know, we also touch on, you know, as we pursue analytical limits and then, you know, where does toxic toxicology, uh, where, 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 what kind of limit are we pursuing? With that said, I think what's missing today is some kind of concept that's, you know, we learn in physical chemistry, which is the uncertainty principle, right? There's time and space, you know, and there's some definite, uh, there's a quanta below which is, there's nothing. You, you cannot get it any, you can only be certain up to a certain limit. And I think what today we don't have is a, is the equivalent of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for chemistry and toxicology. These two are together, but we are pursuing one without recognizing that you're losing on the other side. Uh, question? Yeah, actually, just a, 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 just a comment. I just wanted to follow up on the you know, TTC approach. I think that's, that's our best hope, actually, moving forward. Um, and because a chemical space is just so huge, right? So you're going to be, you know, okay, detecting all sorts of new molecules, and uh, you know, so how do you justify, you know, how do, and, and how do you defend safety? And I think that the, you know, that the TTC approach is is a most promising uh, tool that we can use, and I hope that we can, you know, we can all come together and try to push the forward. Um, you know, as you all know, the the TTC approach actually branched out of the TOR approach. Um, so I, I just think, uh, you know, that's something that we should all support, you know, f up, up, I, 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 for the benefit of, um, you know, of the food industry in particular. I had a follow-up question, this question, I really like this nine, I like all of your responses so far. If we kind of put that together, uh, just yesterday, Erin Brockovich happened to be on NPR, and she was talking, and she went, oh, such and such is in the water at 1,000, oh, I forget the units. <laughs> and, and, then, and then she goes on, and she said something about and this is present at one parts per trillion. And it was like, 
Okay, so Trillions. with <laughs> huge number, huge amount. So with this in mind, and and lessons learned from BPA, uh, it's been published now that we have real risk. That's a factor, of course, between hazard and exposure. But there's perceived risk. It's which we need to deal with, which is the public's perception of the risk, which is the hazard followed by outrage. And, and we can only control the outrage. And this is going to get to be a bigger and bigger problem because zero keeps getting smaller. If you were to pick up a newspaper today, nobody would believe it that the year I was born, the water and the air was so much dirtier. There was no EPA. And now it's cleaner than ever. And, but if you were to pick up a newspaper, and as most people do, it's driven by media that's just hazard. So as industry and as government and as scientists, how do you propose that we control not the hazard, but the outrage? <laughs> Yeah, let me answer something else. <laughs> um, you, you hit on the major points there. It's the public perception. It's what we were talking about recently, and it's um, it's one. You just uh, move that microphone. I'm too quiet. I know. Um, and the the public perception, and it just threw me off there for a minute. Uh, the goal, one of the big challenges, we're talking about challenge toxicology, tox challenges in chemistry, but you hit the major challenge for us all to do to work together is public education. I think that's the only answer. It's making sure we're conveying the science in a way that people can understand, not too technically, that uh, only we can understand certain cases, but it's the public education, the public outreach, putting the hazard into perspective of the exposure and explaining exactly what that, that means. I think that's all we can do. We can't you can't control people, you can't control outrage, but you can try to stay calm and explain the science as best as possible. We, we, we did propose at dinner last night that we should start blogging more, as others seem to do and seem to help control that outrage or throw gasoline on it, whichever um, is your perspective. I, I think that's a really good idea, actually. <laughs> uh, Genuinely, if you want to make any ground in the public sphere, you've got you to gotta engage in the actual battleground where these arguments happen. And a lot of scientists are utterly removed from where the misperception of risk actually happens. So I would say people actually do need to get stuck in there on social media. There's a lot of very good science-based blogs that I would follow that are like called the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Um, IFLS, which I want to explain, stands for. Um, these kind of blogs are, are, are pushing the public perception and understanding of science. And I think that is, is, the, is the counterbalance that needs to happen. And it has to happen. It can't, it's not going to happen in the peer reviewed literature. Nobody's going to read that. So you, you're going to have to, you're going to have, you're going to have to engage in the actual battleground where this happens. And I, I think blogging is actually a very good step. And you need a clever name. Absolutely. Gonna, oh, yeah. You know, don't go with what you're working with now. Yeah and get rid of the PhD at the end of your name. <laughs> so actually, uh, one of the things that I, got fl I flagged this morning was the talk about the different uh, exposure limits for proposing, proposed limits for infants versus adults. You know, how are we gonna manage that? I mean, just an open question, because it's, it's not okay for infants, but it's okay for adults. But as a packaging user, all my packaging I don't know. I don't package just for, just for infants or just for adults. I buy my packaging from a company that supplies me with packaging. So does, does the infant level become the new de facto in, uh, level for our packaging? I, I, if, if I were evaluating it, I would, I would say yes. Yeah. I mean, Be so because you, you, can't, you, you can't make that statement to say, well, this would be okay if you were an adult. It, it, once again, it's that compliance gap. Right. Now it becomes a exposure hazard gap. Actually, if I can comment on that, um, and not 
not to comment on presentations that I did not give, but <laughs> in reality, there is no, the, the, t the testing tiers are the same. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's adult exposure or um, infant exposure, and that's one of the things I think uh, Jason, or maybe it was Kirk, I'm not sure, was trying to make clear in their slides. Um, it's all a matter of how you express the units. The concentration actually is the same or I should say the exposure is the same when you're expressing it on a body weight basis. So an infant has a smaller body weight than an adult. So their overall systemic exposure for a given concentration in food is gonna be dependent on how big they are. If I mean, it's like, if you like to drink beer and you're 300 pounds, you can drink a lot more beer than somebody who weighs 150 pounds. It's, uh, it, there is no difference it's just uh, well, how you express the units. Or what was the question? Was that the answer to the question, or is that more of long? You're going to get your material from a manufacturer. How do you know that was approved for an infant style use or another product? And that's part of the food contact notification process. Is now on. Um, I mean, maybe you can talk about that, Paul, about the additional language on the notification for um, when we've evaluated for infant food safety. Yeah, and from that standpoint, it's also no different than um, a substance that's approved for use in fatty foods or aqueous foods, but isn't approved for use in fatty foods. Um, infant foods is just another food type. It's really no difference between, it's just a different limitation on the use. It's the same thing, as I said, for something that's allowed for use in aqueous, but isn't allowed for use in fatty. So it, you would have to do the same diligence with your materials supplier as a packaging manufacturer as you have to do for any other uh, additive that has a, a, a food type limitation. With respect to the uh, infant, um, you know, regulation, I guess, that you guys are proposing, I haven't uh, had any real conversations about that, but something that we we might consider, which I haven't talked to Kirk and company about, um, what we did learn from the BPA story was that, you know, initially, I actually did the testing for us. We measured bisphenol A coming out of a polycarbonate bottle according to our regulations. It was there, no question about it. Uh, but when we went, eventually went to reading the instructions on the infant formula container and then mixing it in a polycarbonate bottle and serving it within the time frame of which an infant would consume it, you can't measure bisphenol A. So there, there, we, we may just think of that concept that, that we may look at it, you know, as a use condition instead of always looking at the worst case. Um, that's something that, you know, but the damage was done after we made our measurement in a polycarbonate bottle many, many years before that the whole thing blew up. Uh, they, you know, it's just there. You know, you can see it. They said they, they quoted the numbers. You know, and but but when you actually mix up some infant formula in a polycarbonate bottle, shake it up and feed it to an infant, that's how I fed my kids. Um, you know, the, it was unmeasurable, uh, and and even with low detection limits, I mean, this, the, we. Could seriously measure pretty low detection. I still couldn't measure it. So that's just a, a thought that you know, as we formulate the new infant thing, it's something to think about. No, I think that goes back to what's been said before: is trying to get those uh, more refined exposure estimates. And you know, as Paul pointed out, our recommendations are recommendations. If there's a different way, a better way, then you know, we'll take a look at it and come and talk to us about it. So there may be alternative ways of calculating any exposure. So we definitely want to, I mean, uh, doing it uh, with respect to our rec recommendations, you're looking at kind of a worst case. So it's, it's from a safety perspective, that's a good thing. It's conservative, but sometimes you do need to refine your exposure estimates. So, so I grew up in the exposure risk assessment world in the 80s. That's where I cut my teeth with, with doing it. And, and one thing I've learned that we might think about how we apply it going forward is sort of having sort of screening assessments, then refined assessments, et cetera. So you start out with the worst case, and this is how 
I think of in doing product stewardship. You do the worst case sort of scenario and you say, if the worst case doesn't give me an answer that keeps me up at night, that there's harm that's going to occur, et cetera, then I stop there. But if it does, then what I start doing is sort of a sensitivity analysis and say which factors are the most important factors to get a more realistic estimate of the true exposure and true risk and the true outcome and maybe even the true hazard because everybody says hazard is in, in, you know, inherent to the product but actually all hazard probably isn't created equal and diagnosed, diagnosed equal because you can have some hazards that are believed to occur in, with some materials but in some species that hazard isn't relevant to the species because it doesn't produce the same effect and I think we saw some species things and some people say well that's toxicology and that's hazard but when you also think about the factor of what keeps people up at night and I'm going to come back to outrage in one second and it's sort of the voluntary versus involuntary so somewhere in this whole process we need to go ahead and say let's refine it around and you have all the science and you package all the science and you say we continue to bring this in to be the most realistic estimate and the ro most re realistic scenario we have, then we need to step back from it and say, okay, then what drives outrage if it's involuntary decision, right? We know that. If it's being done to me, I'm going to be outraged. And that's where EPA learned about radon when they started to do the radon in your home. If you owned the home and radon was in your home, people wouldn't test. They had to get people outraged. and so. What they did is they said, oh, we'll do it at the real estate transaction stage, right? And so then they said, now I can blame the prior owners so that they've got to pay to fix the problem. I, I think we need to think through how the public thinks about hazard and risk and how we go ahead and build credibility because it all comes down to the credibility of these sophisticated mathematic models that you hide behind a black box, right, in FACET. Yeah, that data is in a black box. We can't see the factors of the confidential information there. What does that lead to in terms of the public trust? And that's where we probably need to think about is how do we regain the public t trust because it's so bad in some situations that it's political science, not real science, that drives the decisions, like with BPA probably, right? Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, with that, I would like to um, call this, me the, this morning's session to a close. I'd like to thank uh, all of our speakers for sharing um, all of their knowledge and experience in these areas, as well as participating in this panel. And I, I hope that uh, everyone found this of, of uh, great benefit this morning. Thank you. <laughs>